Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. My name is Katie Rowley. I'm with the NOAA Central Library, and we're very happy to have some hurricane hunters with us today to talk about uh, the 2020 hurricane season and what they do. So first up, you are muted. If you are attending, you are muted. So if you have a question that you would like to ask, please place that in the question or the chat panel, and we will get to it at the end of the presentation. If you have any issues with your audio or visual components of the webinar, please try logging off and logging back in to GoToWebinar. That solves most issues. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan Shannon to introduce our two speakers. Hello, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jonathan Shannon. I'm here at the NOAA's Aircraft Operations Center in Lakeland, Florida. Uh, with me today are two of our fabulous Gulfstream 4 pilots, Commander Rebecca Waddington and Lieutenant Commander Daniel Barwag. Um, so the NOAA Aircraft Operations Center brings the, the science in the sky. Uh, we support a lot of different missions. Today we're going to talk about our Hurricane Hunter missions, but right now we've got some snow survey missions ongoing, also some North Atlantic right whale mission, uh, marine mammal survey missions going on. So we do a lot here. Uh, you're gonna hear straight from our pilots about that and all the types of missions we do. So thank you for joining us. I will uh, disappear my face from your screen so you don't have to see me anymore and we can concentrate on our great pilots. So Rebecca, take it away. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, well, thank you everybody for joining us today. It's my great pleasure to tell you guys about the Aircraft Operations Center uh, referred to as AOC and our Hurricane Hunters. Uh, go ahead to the next slide, Jonathan. <laughs> First, a little bit about me. My name is Rebecca Waddington. Um, I've been with the NOAA Corps for almost 16 years now, and I fly both the Gulfstream 4 and our King Air 350 aircraft. I actually started in NOAA by going to sea and made the transition over to the aircraft side after spending some time at the National Hurricane Center. My background is in meteorology, so combining my love for hurricanes and flying through them is a pretty great position to be in. Next slide. So the Aircraft Operations Center has about 110 employees and it's a mix of NOAA Corps officers and civilian employees. The NOAA Corps officers fill the roles of the pilots and navigators as well as our commanding officer and the civilian employees act as engineers, meteorologists and other support staff and we really could not do our job without everybody there acting as a team. Uh, once we get a project started, it starts with our programs office and we, we determine how the aircraft needs to be configured and our science and engineering branch take it over from that point. Our maintainers are constantly making sure that our aircraft are in mission ready status. Um, and then the pilots will take it once it's ready to go on mission. Next slide, please. So we are located in Lakeland, Florida. We moved to Lakeland from McDill Air Force Base back in the summer of 2017. Uh, construction actually began in December of 2016 and we were able to move in only 250 days later, which is quite remarkable for getting a new hangar up and running. Uh, we're currently in the process of expanding that hangar. Uh, our aircraft recapitalization plan includes a Gulfstream 550, which is going to replace our Gulfstream 4. And we're also looking to get additional King Air aircraft and Twin Otter aircraft. So we will now have a second hangar um, to be able to place those aircraft as well as much increased office space for the additional support personnel that we're gonna need to be able to operate this increased staff. Next, please. So what kind of aircraft do we fly? Uh, many people know of a, the NOAA aviation as simply the Hurricane Hunters. And when we say the Hurricane Hunters, we're referring to our 2P3 aircraft and our Gulfstream 4. But we actually have nine aircraft in our fleet, although right now we have 10 um, because we are replacing our jet prop, which is in the top center location. That aircraft is going away and being replaced by a King Air 350, which will bring us to two King Air 350s and then four Twin Otters. Our light aircraft are really the workhorses of the fleet. They are used all year round doing different missions, everything from marine mammal survey to low level snow survey, coastal mapping, emergency response, you name it, we do it. If it helps support the environment and NOAA's mission, we are on board. Uh, but today we're gonna focus on the Hurricane Hunter aircraft. Next, please. 
So I'll start with the Gulf Stream 4. I might be a little biased, but it's the best one. Uh, we just have one Gulf Stream 4 and it is very unique. It's the only high altitude research jet of its kind that does these hurricane missions. Um, its mission is more of a surveillance mission and we fly above and around the storm environment. We can get up to 45,000 feet, which is really helpful in helping us to build a vertical profile of the storm. Uh, during hurricane season, we are on standby to fly either operational hurricane missions or hurricane research missions. During non-hurricane season, we have other missions that we support, which include atmospheric rivers. And Danielle actually just returned from that this weekend and I'll be heading out um, next week for that same mission. It's very similar to the hurricane missions, but operating in a winter storm environment. We also support a mission called GRAV-D where we're literally measuring the minute changes in the acceleration of gravity. Um, to help build the Earth's geoid, which will be used in flood forecasting. Next, please. So our P3s, we've got two of those. Um, these are, we'll call it the sport utility version to the luxury model that the G4 is. Uh, the P3s are the ones that are flying low level right into the center of the hurricanes. Um, they typically fly between eight and 10,000 feet, and they're really looking at gathering data that will help determine the storm's intensity. The G4's data helps more with the track forecast. Um, so together, the two aircraft are providing just a complete data set to really help the hurricane forecasters understand the storms and help improve the forecast. Um, I failed to mention the G4 is actually nicknamed Gonzo. And if you notice on the picture, it's got an extended nose, which is how it got that name. Um, and that complements our two P3s, which are nicknamed Kermit and Miss Piggy. So if you ever hear those in the news, you'll know that they're talking about the NOAA aircraft hurricane hunters. Next, please. So why do we fly missions? You know, when we're out in the public, a lot of times people will look at us and say, you guys are crazy. And it's like, yeah, we are. We're crazy and it's great because it's needed. Um, the pictures you see here are from Hurricane Dorian. If you all recall Dorian, it was a very strong storm. It sat over the Bahamas for multiple days, just wreaking havoc on the islands. But we flew missions into Dorian from the very beginning up until it eventually made landfall. Um, the picture on the left is a compilation of all of the tracks that the G4 and the P3 flew. Uh, we are constantly looking at these storms, uh, basically from cradle to grave, because we want to see how they're evolving if they're getting stronger, if they're getting weaker, where they're going. This is all important information to get back not only to the forecasters, but to the public, because that's our ultimate mission is making everyone more safe because they can get a better forecast and make the necessary evacuations and get out of the way of the storm. Next, please. So our aircraft are considered flying laboratories. We have a lot of instrumentation inside the aircraft and on the outside. Uh, I mentioned that the G4 is called Gonzo because of its extended nose, and that's because we have a more intense radar, nose radar, than typical business jets have. Um, that's helping not only keep us safe while we're up there, but also help evaluate the storm itself. So we're constantly looking at that radar. Our flight directors can also see a scan of that radar, and you can see some of those pictures down below of the flight directors in the back of the aircraft actually looking at the radar and helping us in the front of the aircraft determine where to go. Uh, the P3 has three radars, the G4 has two. So the G4 has the nose radar and a tail Doppler radar. The P3 has a nose radar, a tail Doppler radar, and also a lower fuselage radar. They also have different equipment on board, such as a step frequency microwave radiometer um, that helps interpret the amount of seafoam on the ocean surface and relate it to the wind speeds. That's really important in looking at the hurricane's intensity. Um, beyond that, we also have multiple probes that are looking at flight level data as we fly at various altitudes through the storms. Next, please. One of the main instruments we have are drop zones. Um, these are instruments that are encased in, if you imagine it, like a Pringles can sized container. Uh, we drop these from the aircraft, um, from the P3, they're dropped at lower altitudes um, where they're flying about 10,000 feet. From the G4, we drop them as high as 45,000 feet. Uh, once they come out of the aircraft, they release that little drag chute, which helps them keep going down um, in a vertical manner so that we can get really good quality data. Uh, takes about 
15 minutes for one of these to fall from 45,000 feet all the way down to the ocean surface. And that entire time, it's collecting information on the, the air pressure, the temperature, humidity, wind speed, and direction. And it's sending all that data back up to the aircraft via radio frequency. Uh, on board the aircraft, our scientists in the back are checking the data to make sure it's good. Um, essentially, all forecast models start with some assumptions. And the data that we get from these drop zones are replacing the, sum the assumptions in the forecast models, which are helping the forecast become more accurate. Um, so our meteorologists and flight directors are checking the data to make sure there's no errors, because any error that they would send on would then get put in the model and make a worse forecast. So we wanna make sure we're only sending good data um, back to our counterparts on the ground at the hurricane, at the National Hurricane Center and the Environmental Modeling Center so that they can take this data, incorporate it into the models and build a better forecast. Um, the picture on the right, while it's an old forecast, it's a really great indication of the impact of these drop zones. Uh, this was a forecast for Hurricane Katrina. And it, you could see there was a study done of how the forecast changed if it included drop zone data and if it didn't. Uh, the red line there is what it would have looked like if it did not include the drop zone data. Um, as you can see, that, not, that would not have been good. The entire city of New Orleans might have thought that they might have been no safe. They still on the right side of the storm, still in the danger zone, but they would have been okay. Uh, whereas you can see where it actually went. And of course, I think everyone here is familiar with the impacts of Hurricane Katrina. Um, that is really important to know where that storm is going. Um, a couple of the storms we had last year, the forecast was accurate to within a couple miles of where it eventually made landfall. So it's really great news that these forecasts are getting better and better throughout the years. Next, please. I talked about the radars a little bit before, but here's where you can actually see what we're seeing on the plane. Uh, the pictures on the left are all from the P3. The one in the top center is the nose radar. One on the bottom left is from our tail Doppler radar. And the one on the bottom right is from the lower fuselage radar. So the combination of those radars really helps build a solid picture of the storm. Um, the tail Doppler radars of both the G4 and the P3 give a great vertical profile of the system. Um, the picture on the upper right is from the G4. And if you could believe it, that was at 45,000 feet. Uh, you can see we're a little bit off track, and that was done on purpose. I promise we're really good pilots when we, when we will need to stay on track, but we purposely deviated because the G4, being the luxury model that it is, is not made to go through that intense convection. But you can see on that nose radar that we had a very clear picture of the eye of the storm uh, where you see that little black hole off to the upper right. Next picture, or next slide, please. One too many. There we go. Uh, I wanted to show this slide so you guys can see the difference in the G4 track and the P3 track. The G4 is a great aircraft in that it can fly high and it can fly fast and it can cover a lot of area. This helps us again with the track forecast because we can not only check out the storm itself, but also fly ahead of it where it's going and see how that environment is going to affect the track of the storm. The picture on the right is our P3 track. And again, they're looking at not only the track, but also the intensity. So they do what we call a figure four pattern, where they fly through the center multiple times, and that way they sample every single quadrant of the storm. You might be thinking hurricane hunting is kind of a funny term. We've got satellites. It's pretty easy to know where the hurricanes are out there. But the term hurricane hunting actually stems from hunting for the very center of the storm. And that's what our P3s are doing. They're looking for that, that eye of the storm where the wind is perfectly calm. Next slide, please. This is just another example of the impact of the G4 and the fact that it can fly so far ahead of the, of the storm's motion. The image on the left is model data from Hurricane Joaquin back in 2015. And you could just see this is where the term spaghetti plots come from. The tracks are just all over the place. Well, our flight track, which you see on the right, that's actually flight level winds. Um, took us around the storm, but also way out into the Gulf of Mexico, pretty far away from the storm. And the reason we flew all the way over there was so that we could sample that front that's kind of draped across northern Florida. We needed to see how strong that front was. If that front was weak, that meant that Hurricane Joaquin could probably punch through it and make a left turn and go over Florida. If it was strong, it would end up pushing it right back out to sea, which fortunately in this case is what ended up happening. 
But because the G4 flew this track and knew the strength of that cold front, we were able to put that in the models and the model started tightening it up and showing that it was gonna go on ski. Uh, with that, I will release the mic and uh, hand it over to Danielle Varwig and she could talk more specifically about her first hurricane season, which was the record shattering season last year. Go ahead, Danielle. Thanks, Rebecca, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining us again. Um, so I'm Lieutenant Commander Danielle Varwig, and before I dig into my experience, I just wanted to give you all a good background of myself and how I came to join NOAA. So I'm originally from New York City, and I went to Penn State, and I did not major in, in, uh, in meteorology, which I know that there's a big mafia uh, there. I actually studied mechanical engineering with the intention of joining the Air Force as an aircraft maintenance officer. Uh, long story short, I ended up becoming a pilot. I did reserve officer training corps and joined the Air Force back in 2007. And I served with them for 13 years. I flew the C-17, which is a multi-engine turbojet cargo aircraft, and the MC-12, which is an, uh, basically a King Air 350, so the exact same plane that we have at AOC, just fixed up to do ISR, so intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions. And then most recently, I was an instructor on the T-6, a single-engine prop uh, aerobatic plane. During that time, I collected about 3,000 flight hours and was looking for a change in pace uh, to continue serving. Uh, long story short, I found through a, a friend of a friend, Noah, and decided to join. Uh, so I apparently became the very first Air Force to NOAA IST or inner service transfer as a pilot at least. Uh, so I joined in, uh, in February of 2020, and that was right before COVID hit. So it took a little bit of a delay for me to eventually start training in an aircraft. I did transition straight to the G4, which is again, unusual. Most people that transfer in go straight to a light aircraft or the P3. Most of our inter-service transfers are actually from the Navy. So they go they, and they already show up previously qualified. So eventually I did get my G4 uh, qualifications uh, and that occurred on August 14th of 2020. And funny enough, if you see on the, uh, the second, the small inset photograph there, it's just a screenshot from NOAA uh, where the Climate Prediction Center, only a week basically before I started flying officially for NOAA is when they predicted the season to be extremely active, which updated their outlook that was originally given in May for it just to be an active season. So great timing on my part for sure. Uh, next slide, please, Jonathan. So my first hurricane ended up being Marco. Well, funny enough, I thought it was gonna be Laura, if anyone is familiar with how that whole evolution went off um, back in August. Uh, so with Marco, um, it was already an M storm in, in M storm in August, which I later found out was apparently the earliest 13th named storm in the Atlantic uh, area in history. So that's fun fact. Uh, and then also it was the second of two uh, storms to form, eventually uh, looking for the Gulf with the first being Laura uh, further out into the Atlantic. So good times for sure. Uh, the picture on the left shows the tracks, the predicted tracks, uh, and then the second uh, photo on the right shows the model. So just like Rebecca was talking about, the spaghetti charts were sort of all over the place. And so we needed to get some more fidelity on where we expected Marco to end up uh, going. The very small picture on the bottom right there, that was actually the drop file that was given to us by the National Hurricane Center for the G4 to fly, which is again, sort of a weird circular pattern with some other lines uh, that are a little forward of uh, where this, the center of the storm was predicted to be at the time that we would be taking off. So uh, next slide, please. 
So uh, eventually they decided because of that uncertainty, they needed a G4 to fly out there. And uh, so it, that ended up being my very first flight only about uh, a week after I had, re I had fully qualified in the G4. So it was a very late night show time. I was on the night crew uh, and I remember the date. I have it there in the picture on the 22nd of August, but that happened to be my wedding anniversary, my 12 year wedding anniversary. Uh, and so, yeah, sorry, hubby, had to go fly, hunt some hurricanes. That was a fun time for him, but very exciting for me, absolutely. For the crew, uh, there were three pilots on the crew, which is actually normal pre-COVID. Uh, and uh, because of COVID, we ended up cohorting, which is what Jonathan alluded to earlier, just so that we would minimize intermingling of air crew throughout AOC. So I was stuck with the two only other female uh, Hurricane Hunter pilots at the time, at least, who all happened to fly the G4. So that was super exciting for me, being a female, um, flying with these two extremely competent, amazing women. Um, so for my in-flight experience, overall, it was oddly calm. Most people, when they think of flying into hurricanes, they expect it to be what the P3s would expect, you know, lower to the ground, flying through the eye and just things bouncing everywhere. Um, but it was a little, it was calmer than I'd expected to be. Now, don't get me wrong, there was definitely turbulence and I had some pucker factor moments, if you will. Um, but overall not as crazy another fun fact is that apparently tropical storms which marco was at the time are generally more rough um, than fully formed hurricanes are mainly because they're still trying to develop and so we would experience more turbulence uh, during that time than flying into tropical storms than we would into full hurricanes Additionally, because it was a midnight showtime, we were flying mainly at night. So nighttime flying towards a hurricane, fun. And then also CDO flying, which I learned about as well. So central dense overcast. It's a very, uh, it is a level, level of overcast on top of the hurricane, um, which means for us that we can't really see anything even if it were daytime so in terms of towering cumulonimbus clouds we can't avoid them we have to rely on our radar pictures to help us out lucky for me i had rebecca on board with me too our resident meteorologist and she actually pointed out the eye of the storm um, and that was right around the time where marco was Kind of dabbling in the cat one region uh, it didn't last there very long but that was a really cool picture for me to get on my very first flight um so um just like i talked about we don't have any visual indicators so we really have to rely on the radar picture to navigate through and rebecca talked about this as well where we're using that uh, as in conjunction with our flight directors in the back to try and navigate through as much as we can. Um, in general, not all of the hazards that we experience in the hurricane environment, we can identify with the, uh, with the instrumentation that we have on board. So that means that there is gonna be a lot of surprises and throughout my entire experience flying, I've had several of those with just your sudden bumps or with lightning flashes or St. Elmo's fire um, or all those sort of things. Um, so it makes it very interesting, very dynamic environment. <clears throat> so uh, let's move, actually this last slide or last picture on the right here is after we were all done with our flight, <clears throat> That's the, what the spaghetti models look like after the fact. So Jonathan, if you go back to the first or the previous slide, you can see that they're all over the place the day prior. And then back to the next slide, they tightened up really well, or at least a little bit better. And we flew, I flew one more flight. So I think it was three more flights after this first flight of mine into Marco, which narrowed the track down even further, um, helped out a lot there. Okay, next slide, please. <clears throat> So overall, for my hurricane season, I mean, firstly, this was an amazing season for me to get started. I ended up flying six of the 30 named storms, uh, which a lot of them don't actually affect the U.S., so that's 
that means that the G4 isn't necessarily needed for all of them. Uh, but six storms in one hurricane season is actually pretty significant, especially for the G4. Uh, so they were Marco, Laura, Sally, Teddy, Delta, and Zeta. Um, my first 80 hours in the G4 with the exception of the initial flights that I needed to get fully qualified, were all tropical storm and hurricane flights. And overall, I learned so much. Because I didn't graduate Penn State with a meteorology degree and only a mechanical engineering degree, and I also grew up in the Northeast, I didn't have a lot of experience with hurricanes. So I learned so, so much from Hurricane Hunter evolution from start to finish from the NHC requirement to its approaching landfall and seeing how the cone shrinks and how the spaghetti models tighten up as well. There was also the additional value because of COVID and how that affected everyone's hurricane preparation. Uh, so knowing sooner than later for the people, for the general US population and other populations as well, um, how much our input helped people make better, smarter decisions as soon as possible. Uh, additionally, I learned that green on the radar, like Rebecca talked about, is no good at flight level 450, um, which is contrary to what I had learned just flying at lower altitudes in pretty much any other plane. Uh, so a lot more heads up, paying attention to the radar than normal. And the list goes on from there. Uh, it's been such a crazy experience for me. Um, and just looking at the stats here on the slide, you can see that there's just so much going on and not just me personally, everyone in the G4, P3 um, and beyond have had such a crazy impact from it. Uh, for me, I'm just proud to have been able to shift my, my focus to serve based off of science. Uh, so it's been really, really uh, warming to my heart to do so and save people at the same time. So that's about it. <laughs> that took us about maybe just shy of 30 minutes. So we will leave it at that. Great, thank you so much. This was amazing. I learned a lot and we have several questions uh, popping up. So I'm going to start reading those off if uh, Jonathan is good to go with that. Yep, that sounds great. Okay, our first question uh, was at a given time, how many planes are profiling, profiling a tropical cyclone? At any given time, there could be about three in there. Um, when we use both of our P3s, we're usually using one during the day and one at night. So you might have one of our P3s in the storm as well as the G4, and then there could be an Air Force Hurricane Hunter out there as well. Uh, we work in conjunction with them um, as a nice partnership to make sure that all storms get covered. Fun fact, just to pile on to that, that I learned, is because we're all dropping drop-sons, we have to coordinate with one another to make sure that we're not dropping them on top of each other. So we'll try and check in on the radio um, as long as we, you know, if we think that there might be a conflict and make sure that we're not interfering with each other's science. I should point out my guest speaker back here, back there. Uh, he's allowed to be here. His name is Simpson. He was born at the National Hurricane Center. He's named after the Saffir Simpson scale, so he's official. Nice. Thank you. Our next question, are you normally flying at the same altitude for each aircraft? No, uh, definitely not because just like with the drop zones, we don't want to inadvertently impact each other. So the G4 is definitely staying high altitude. Uh, we could usually take off and climb immediately to flight level 410 or 41,000 feet. Um, after that, we have to wait till we burn some fuel to be able to climb higher, but we'll ultimately get up to 45,000 feet. Uh, the P3s will stay lower. Their altitude varies depending on the mission that they're doing. So if they're doing an operational mission, the National Hurricane Center might want them at a certain altitude. That might be different than if they're doing a research mission. Um, and then if the P3s and the Air Force are both in the storm at the same time, they will definitely make sure that they're flying at different altitudes. Great, thank you. Our next question, are the planes flown into or near the hurricanes retrofitted with designs for extra turbulence? No, none of the aircraft are strengthened in any way other than the floorboard of the P3. Uh, that is reinforced just because of all the equipment and the weight of the equipment. 
But other than that, they are the same G4 that you'd find on any other business G4, um, structurally speaking. And same thing with the P3s. They're just like any other P3. Great. Thank you. Uh, the next question is for uh, Lieutenant Commander. How is flying for NOAA different than flying for the U.S. Air Force? I think, well, the flying in general is the same. It's a matter of the mission. So with my Air Force flying, it was all focused on warfighter effort, warfighter support, warfighter creation. Um, but here it's all about, at least for me in the G4, which is mainly uh, the storm flying, uh, it's all about service to, uh, to save lives and more focused on science instead. So that would be the main difference. The flying itself is pretty much the same. Great, thank you. Uh, Commander Waddington, you mentioned it takes uh, drop zones 15 minutes to fall to the ocean surface. Do you only drop them over water or are they also dropped over land? No, they're only dropped over water because even though they're about the size of a Pringles can and only weigh about two pounds, if they were to hit somebody on the head from 45,000 feet, that would be a pretty shock. So uh, we only drop them over the water. Uh, we're constantly scanning our instruments on board to make sure that there are no aircraft beneath us. Um, and we'll make calls on the emergency frequency, um, just alerting any aircraft in the area that we might not see a radar return from that we're going to be dropping the instrument. Uh, once they get in the water, the majority of it actually disintegrates in the water. Um, so we're trying to leave as little pollution as possible. Great, thank you. Uh, next question, does everyone share in the data collected? For example, does NOAA get the data collected from uh, the Air Force uh, Hurricane Hunter? Yeah, that all gets, um, they all get sent to the National Hurricane Center and the Environmental Modeling Center. So anybody can access that. Thank you. Uh, we have some interested people with a ride along. Is there ever an open seat for an interested NOAA scientist? During non-COVID era? Yes, um, and there is a list. Um, we did not do any ride-alongs last year because of COVID and we're anticipating not being able to do any this year, but we're hoping to be able to do that again in the future years. And that is open to scientists um, with a direct interest in the mission um, or any media. And you can contact Jonathan Shannon if you're interested in that. Great, thank you. I believe this question is directed towards uh, Lieutenant Commander. Is the Air Force WC-130Js have a similar mission to the P or the W-3s? Yes, yep, they're, they do exactly the same thing. Yep, the 53rd, what is it, Weather Reconnaissance Squadron? Um, yeah, so they fly the same exact thing. Um, I think Rebecca could probably dive into a little bit more who gets called upon when uh, between the P-3s and the uh, Air Force C-130s? Yeah, the main difference in the two platforms is uh, that the P-3s have that lower fuselage radar. The C-130s simply sit too low to the ground, so they don't have that capability. Um, so for operational missions tasked by the National Hurricane Center, uh, they can task either NOAA or the Air Force, and a lot of times they're looking to see where the storm is and where the national assets are located. Um, so the Air Force all their aircraft are located in um, Biloxi, Mississippi, and we're of course here in Lakeland. Um, so they might see who's available and who can reach the storm fastest. Uh, for the research missions, they usually task the P3 because of that lower fuselage radar. Yes, uh, the P3 also has a, a tail Doppler radar as well, which is uh, really important too for that vertical profiling of the storm system. And both the, the P3s and the C-130s can actually be forward deployed as well, uh, as well as the G4 to places like Barbados or St. Croix or, or other areas in order to get um, you know, even further out and, and get that information uh, in advance for our Caribbean uh, partners and, and other areas so that we can help them prepare as well for our agreements through the National Hurricane Center. Thank you for expanding on that, Shane, uh, Jonathan. Uh, next question, do you coordinate your flight paths with the FAA or do your flight uh, flights differ from a commercial passenger aircraft? They definitely differ from a commercial traffic. Um, would you coordinate them? We file them just like any other aircraft would file a flight path, uh, but we're not following uh, pre-planned 
flight routes like the commercial air traffic use. Um, so we always file them. A couple of things we're looking at is because we're state-owned aircraft, we have to make sure that we have the appropriate overflight clearance for the various island nations and Mexico um, to be able to fly over their airspace while doing our mission. So we will get our flight path and request the appropriate clearance. Many of the islands give us a blanket overflight clearance that is good for the entire season. Other nations want us to get it on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and then once we get the appropriate clearances, we will file the flight path with the FAA. Thank you. Um, I have a personal question. How long uh, can you stay in the air on these aircraft and before you need to refuel? Too long. <laughs> The, uh, the G4 missions are typically eight and a half hour missions and the T3s can go much longer, um, but their typical mission is usually around 10 hours. Do you have a coffee machine on board? <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we do have coffee. It's not a machine. We, uh, we get the coffee ahead of time and usually drink it at the beginning of the flight while it's still warm. We do have a microwave. <laughs> good, good to know. Um, our next question, can you expand a bit on the missions flown outside of hurricane season? Sure. Uh, Danielle, do you want to talk about atmospheric rivers since you just came from it? Sure, yeah. Um, I mean, it was my first experience flying it this year round, um, but it's so over the Pacific Ocean, generally there will be um, I guess creation of weather patterns that affect the west coast uh, of the US. And so we're doing sort of the same thing, um, but it's more so weather study, not necessarily um, trying to figure out where these rivers of atmospheric weather, the winter storms are actually going, um, just so that they can better predict when they're coming in the future. Um, at least that's what I got out of it uh, this last few times that I flew it. Um, even though I was out there for a month, it's all depending on when these storms actually develop and um, we are actually tasked to fly them. So. Um, that's at least atmospheric rivers. And I think we also did a winter storms project that was separate from that. Um, yeah, that, that was it was very similar. Uh, that was done uh, several years ago, uh, but very similar as, as far as the mission profile. Um, and then the Grab D mission that I talked about earlier is a mission that we can either do on its own or in conjunction with atmospheric rivers or even hurricane season. Um, so that project only requires one instrument on board. So we can actually have that on board along with our typical hurricane configuration. Um, that mission requires zero turbulence. So it's complete opposite of a storm mission, uh, which is why they can be kind of flown together. When there's no weather, we can go and fly the Grab D mission. Um, so that's on the G4. On the P3, they do an ocean winds project. Um, which is where they are flying low-level surveys um, over the North Atlantic or North Pacific to basically study the waves and by virtue of the waves, seeing what the wind speed is and calibrating that with satellite wind data. Um, so the last couple of years, they based out of Ireland and flew over the North Atlantic, and they are currently up in Anchorage, Alaska and flying over the North Pacific. Um, they also do some spring storm missions uh, which are a bit more harrowing even than the hurricane missions for the P3s. Uh, those missions are focused on studying the uh, Midwest thunderstorms. So if you're familiar with the Midwest thunderstorms at all, you can know that those are some of the most intense thunderstorms you can ever encounter, oftentimes producing tornadoes. So the P3 flies in and around those storms, uh, studying the conditions and trying to see if there's any correlation between uh, storms that do produce tornadoes and storms that don't produce tornadoes. Great, thank you. Out of curiosity, what is the lowest altitude a P3 has ever flown at? Oh, that is a good question, and I don't know the answer off the top of my head. Um, John, yeah, I'll, I'll that? try and fill that in. Yeah, so um, it depends on the mission. So uh, for some of the air chemistry missions, I believe they've flown as low as uh, 500 or 1,000 feet. Um, the P3s were just in Barbados in February 2020 doing the atomic mission, which was looking at the the generation of uh, mid-latitude or tropical clouds uh, from Barbados. And they were flying steps from, you know, 500 feet up to, you know, 15,000 feet, uh, measuring all of the different air masses uh, where these clouds are being formed. So 
I, I'd say probably 500 feet over the water is is, is uh, where they've been. So, so for some of the investigation missions as well, uh, when a, a tropical, they think a tropical depression may form into a tropical storm, I think that's usually around 1,500 feet uh, to, to 3,000 feet uh, as they're looking for that circulation uh, within the, the lower level lower level clouds. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, one other mission I failed to, to mention because sometimes it can get glossed over as it gets wrapped up with the hurricane mission on the G4 is the Saharan air layer studies. Um, so the Hurricane Research Division is very interested in how that dust coming off of Africa can affect the formation of storms. So there will be times when the G4 will fly specifically to study the atmosphere in these dust plumes. Great, thank you all. I'm not seeing uh, more questions and I hope I didn't miss any of them. Um, but while people may be typing their last question, uh, we will be having another kind of hurricane season outlook uh, talk in the library next month. But what are your predictions for the 2021 season? I'm a meteorologist. I know not enough not to predict anything. <laughs> okay, okay, keep your secrets. Um, <laughs> and we do have a question about, um, maybe Jonathan can answer this one. Is there a hurricane hunter museum somewhere or is there a plans for one possibly? Yes, that is a good question. Um, so we here at the Aircraft Operations Center are working on a couple of, uh, you know, just displays inside our our area, but we uh, support the, the, the NOAA Heritage Pro Program a lot. So we've been uh, providing things for their, their NOAA Open House or the uh, Gateway to NOAA exhibit uh, back in Silver Spring. We also have a, a pieces that we send to the traveling uh, Noah's Ark exhibit um, that you know goes or goes around and and we've partnered with the um, Sun and Fun or the the Florida Air Museum here in Lakeland uh, with a, a bit of uh, an exhibit on the Noah Corps and Noah in general. But yeah, as far as um, for the Air Force side of things, they've been around since what was it of uh, uh, 46 when the uh, Lieutenant Colonel Duckworth took that bet to fly into a hurricane, I believe. Uh, so uh, they might have something based at the uh, Keesler Air Force Base, but I am not sure. Great, thank you. And as you were talking, a few more questions came in. Um, how do you account for the impact of the dust on the airplanes when you're doing that? So it's actually the altitude at which we fly, it's um, not very dense, so we're okay with that, uh, but we're dropping the drop zones through that dust plume layer, so that's where the max of it is, is our drop zones are capturing that information, um, and it's not so so much of an impact on the jet itself. Great. Uh, we have a question, do you use airports all over the country and all over the world, or do you always come back to a certain base? We try to have specific bases that we'll come back to uh, because they're familiar and we can set up um, like our maintenance there. As Jonathan was talking about, when we forward deploy, uh, we'll have a specific place in mind. Um, some of our typical ones are St. Croix in Virgin Islands and Barbados. Um, of course, those are also within the tracks of many of the storms. So we have to develop contingencies um, for where to land if the, if the storm looks like it's going to impact those islands. Um, so we'll use any airport um, that has a long enough runway and the facilities to support us. Great, thank you. And some uh, few more questions. How many people in NOAA are a part of your mission there? And I'm assuming there as in Lakeland. Uh, well, in Lakeland, we have about 110 employees and that's civilian and NOAA Corps, um, but all NOAA, NOAA employees nonetheless. Um, and then, of course, we work in conjunction with the National Hurricane Center and the Hurricane Research Division and Environmental, Environmental Modeling Center, which are all NOAA. Um, and then on our light aircrafts, we fly missions for all of the different line offices. Um, so that's a really hard question to answer on how many people can be involved because the numbers just get exponential as you start talking about more and more missions. Good to know. Uh, Max, uh, what are the pathways to becoming a pilot of a hurricane hunter? Well, I guess there's two, either the Air Force or NOAA. 
Um, I don't know the pathway for the Air Force, so I will leave that one out of it. But for NOAA, the only way to become a NOAA pilot is to become a NOAA Corps officer first. Um, so NOAA Corps officers serve either to operate the ships or the aircraft in NOAA. And when you first come in, you don't get the choice. Um, it's actually about 80% of the officers are on the maritime side and 20% on the aviation side. But you're not hired for one or the other. You're hired as an officer first. Uh, once you're in, you can apply for the aviation program. Um, if you're accepted, uh, you might have already had some flight experience, like Danielle came in with all of her ratings from the Air Force. Um, I had no flight experience. I come in from the maritime side. So my first aviation job in NOAA was actually going to flight school to go from having zero flight hours to having a commercial multi-engine uh, with instrument type rating. And after that, I went to uh, platform specific training. So for me, I started with the King Air. So I went to King Air school. And then a lot of that's on the job training with the King Air. Um, as Danielle mentioned, it was very unusual that we brought her straight to the G4, but we felt with her massive experience from the Air Force, it would be a good fit. Um, but usually the pilots in NOAA will start off on the light aircraft and then apply for a heavy aircraft selection board. Um, and then at that point get selected for either the G4 or the P3. Great, thank you. And I'm going to pick one more question. Uh, what three things would you share with a high school audience about this career choice? You want to each take one? <laughs> sure. Oh, um, I I would say that it is a great option, particularly for those who don't like sitting in an office, because we get to be out and experiencing the science. Uh, which to me is just a lot of fun. It is a lot of hard work, but it's a lot of fun and it opens doors to so many things. I never thought I'd be a pilot and here I am flying this beautiful aircraft that you see in front of you. Um, so there are opportunities. I would definitely say if you want to travel, um, that's definitely a a peak option um, if you fly for AOC. Um, everyone's all over at least stateside. I mean, I just came from Hawaii and we do a lot of work in the Caribbean as well uh, and Alaska for sure. Um, and then also if you want to fly and don't want to pay any money to fly, it's definitely a great way to you know, learn how to fly and serve your country at the same time for free. You don't get paid to do it anyway. So that's pretty neat. And science is super cool, you know, and if there's a way that you can be active and still participate in scientific study, then I think this is definitely the route to go. Jonathan, anything from your side? Well, I guess, you know, the general stay in school, uh, <laughs> work hard, study hard. They, they, they said all the glamorous things, but, you know, uh, they, they both obviously put in a lot of work to be where they are, but uh, the, the opportunities are there. Um, and it's just, you know, uh, figure out what your interests are and, and pursue them with a passion like these ladies have. And I think there's, there's a place for you at AOC. Thank you so much. And I, the attendees want me to thank you as well for giving them such an amazing and a cool, inspiring presentation today. I want to remind everybody we recorded this. So if you want to pass this on to you, the high schooler you know, or uh, your fellow colleague in NOAA, uh, the library will put this up on our YouTube channel. And with that, I will give everyone back uh, 10 minutes of their day. Please have a wonderful and safe Wednesday. Thank you, Lieutenant Commander. Thank you, Commander. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.